if you're in a policy world, this kind of stuff is too intangible. You can't say, hey, we should encourage people to beha behave ethically because uh, I think that's a hard sell in a policy world. And I I'm with Jeremy. If, if we're talking to policymakers, we should be talking about alternative systems of, of laws that make more sense, like uh, uh, global licenses in France or flat rates in Germany or voluntary collective licenses in the United States. I think uh, if, you, if you're in a policy world, you've got to speak a different policy kind of language. And talking about theories of ethics amongst uh, policy people isn't necessarily going to fly. Um, I wonder how your ethics will um, hold up against the reality check. Like if I make music today, I would probably like to see um, like most of the profit coming in over the next half year so that I can pay back the banks. And um, on the other hand, if I now make something that is super awesome and people in 20 years will still uh, listen to and I'm still getting money in 20 years, why would I ever make something new? I would just um, not put out anything new because the people would um, continue to listen and continue paying for the same thing. I think that's true of great music under any scheme in which there is payment for great music or great films or great books. Um, and you can talk about ideas like limited terms, um, saying, well, you know, after 10 years or 20 years, um, okay, you've been paid for, your, for the fact that you produced a great thing and now let's, um, let's remove that, that uh, artist either from the copyright system or from the remuneration pool of a collective license or um, from the algorithm in this crazy ethical theory that I was just bouncing around and the money will go instead to new fans who are trying to produce a new great thing. Um, and in some of those cases, I don't think it makes a big difference. In others, yes, maybe it does make a big difference. And you know, I'm, I, I guess I, I don't have a strong opinion about which way to go. I think copyright terms are way too long and we need to shorten them. But a large part of the reason why we need to shorten them is because they inhibit uh, the creative reuse and, and access to these um, these great works after, even after 50 or 100 years uh, from the date of production. I think we need to get that roadblock out of the way, but that's the main problem with, with term lengths. I don't have a strong opinion about whether artists should still be paid, you know, a, a, a pension in royalties for great stuff they produced back in the 60s. You know? Okay, um, there's another argument that um, copyright might actually be a good thing if it is used to protect uh, free software. Um, it could actually be bad for free software if uh, copyright expired after a couple years because then companies could steal um, the, uh, the source and not contribute back to uh, the community or not be forced to contribute back. And I wonder, um, do you have any thoughts on that? So that's a common argument about copyright law and free software. Um, I think it's... A it doesn't seem to be. My, I don't think my talk tonight is at all relevant to that um, that concern. Uh, I wasn't talking about software copyright at all, anyway. And I, I think there are certain things about software that make it different from uh, music and writing and film, uh, and certain benefits to having software freedom that are kind of more profound, perhaps, than um, uh, the ability to remix other people's music, which is important, but. Uh, you know, software is much, much better if you can see inside it. Um, so yeah, just I, I, you know, you should come and talk to me later about that, and I, I can I can say a bit more about it. But it's not really, um, yeah. Don't take anything in my talk to pertain to software. Well, be before Next. before I go into my question, actually, I think it's uh, a shame that we're talking about copyright specifically about music because I don't see why musical artists should be treated any differently than any other copyrighted uh, medium, but. To, to, to come to the comment I wanted to make, uh, the Belgian Sabam, which is pretty much the, uh, the same as the RIA, but, uh, but in Belgium, made two decisions recently. One is to remind daycare centers that they need to pay for the music that they, pay for, that they play for toddlers. And the second is that they increase the rates uh, for schools uh, for the music that they play for uh, ch kindergarten and, and lower school 
uh, kids. Now, uh, this is uh, commercial products that they're playing for small children uh, with uh, highly influential minds. They come home asking to buy the CDs for the music that they heard in the classrooms. So these people are actually asking for more money for commercially pushing their music on small children. Now, a group of us have actually started uh, combining um, old folk songs, 200-year-old folk songs for which copyright has expired, playing them with amateur musicians, putting them on CDs and distributing them to uh, schools and daycare centers to try to, uh, to, to, to counteract this. Now, I think the ethics of piracy are not what is in question here. I think the question is the ethics of the music industry. I, to I, mean, I totally agree with you. I think it's awesome that you're fighting back against that. And I don't think that uh, there's any excuse for that kind of behavior by collecting societies. Uh, you know, I think it's just a very simple story of economic selfishness on their part. You know, they, they get to take a percentage of this stream of money, and so they're always going to go around and try and make that stream bigger. Um, I don't think there's any excuse for it. Uh, I don't remember when was the last time I paid uh, for watching a movie or paid for a book I read. So I just wonder, can you estimate what fraction of costs uh, is in the distribution and delivery of movies uh, if, if uh, one purchases legitim legitimately, and the same for books? And what fraction of cost uh, is the actual compensation of creating the movie or the book? Perhaps I should, can you say uh, that last bit again? Yes? Uh, sorry, I didn't catch the second. You said what percentage of cost is the uh, distribution? Yes, so typically one, one waits until the movie is available on discs or a book is released as a paperback. What fraction of the cost uh, in a paperback or in a disc uh, is, uh, goes to the creator or the studio or the writer and uh, editor? And what fraction is for distribution of the stuff and printing it and delivery of physical products? So the traditional answer to this for CDs was that in the United States it cost about 5 to $7 uh, to put a CD into a shop and sell it to someone, which was about half the cost of a CD. Um, with books, I think the cost the best way to infer that cost is to look for classics editions of public domain books because those are completely competitive and there's basically no royalties to any publisher, or, you know, very small ro like returns to the publisher and no royalties to any author on those public domain books. And you, you'll, you'll see um, those prices in whichever country you're in, in a bookshop and they'll be, you know, in the United States maybe four or five dollars to get a book onto a shelf in a bookshelf in a bookshop um, and then if you want to know th th so then the rest goes mostly to publishers if you're talking about the music industry um, no, 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 no music, and movies. maybe sorry movies only documentaries uh, fiction movies no music industry I don't listen to music so with with films films and so books, say so bo as I said, it, with books, I think it's about five dollars to get a book into a bookshop on the shelf, um, and so the rest goes usually with books about fifty fifty to the publisher and the author um, with m films, um, the cost of a dvd i 'm actually not sure i don 't know if anyone else can answer that question, but i can 't with the dvd hi um. I see one big um, issue with uh, the system you propose is